Uh, so hello everyone and welcome to today's uh, Contagion Cultures webinar. Um, while everyone is just sort of joining us, I will introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jessica Seeley. I am a second year PhD student in cultural studies here at Queen's University. Uh, to begin, let us acknowledge that Queen's is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. Land acknowledgements are an imperfect step towards decolonizing the academy, which is an inherently colonial and imperial institution. Today, I invite all of our viewers to reflect on the history of the land which we live on and to continue to honor the presence of Indigenous peoples by working towards decolonization. The Contagion Culture Series is a Faculty of Arts and Science collaboration between the School of Policy Studies and Languages, Literatures, and Cultures, with Queen's a Library providing substantive support. Uh, these talks are live streamed Tuesdays at 4 p.m. Eastern. The series will continue until the end of winter term 2021. Uh, Queen's Contagion Cultures lectures help make sense of the pandemic through the expertise and insights of arts and science faculty members. This public facing series leverages the powerful tool of humanistic analysis to grapple with our turbulent times. To ask questions, please submit them by typing into the Q&A feature that you can find in the lower middle section of your screen. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christiane Arndt. Dr. Arndt is an associate professor of German literature in the Department of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures at Queen's University. She has a PhD in German literature from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore and has previously held Humboldt fellowships in Berlin and Lübeck. Her current research focuses on literary and visual representations of disease around the turn of the 20th century. She has previously published on 18th and 19th century as well as contemporary German literature and historic photography with several publications focusing on the intersection of literature, medicine, and visuality in the work of German writers. Most recently, the article Calculating Death in Arthur Schnitzler's Novella Sturban, published in the Germanic Review. She is also a co-editor on the German volume Organism and Society, The Body in German Language Literature, 1830 to 1930, and the author of her monograph Farewell to Reality, Problems Concerning Representation in German Language Literary Realism. Her presentation today is titled Images of Fear, the Use of Photographs by the 19th Century Anti-Vaccine Movement, which discusses the rise of anti-vaccination sentiment in 19th century that emerged as a result of public health policies such as the British Vaccination Act of 1840. Organized movements of anti-vaccination activists developed across Europe and the UK, and today's talk will focus on their use of photography and publications arguing against the administration of vaccines. This is a topic that is particularly relevant today, given the prevalence of visuals and visual technologies in our everyday lives, in addition to the current atmosphere of fear and disinformation, which has been made even more acute by the recent rollout of various COVID-19 vaccines. So without further ado, I will pass things over to Dr. Arndt to begin. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very grateful to be able to share some of my research in this forum, and I will now share my screen with you so that you can actually see the pictures that are really fun. As COVID-19 vaccines are administered, the public health measure reignites the often heated debate about vaccines. This debate is a recurring discourse that has been around since Edward Jenner's description of his smallpox vaccine in the end of the 18th century. During the 19th century, the anti-vaccine movement gained momentum and with the development of photography, its proponents started to use images. This use of images displays a dynamic that is still informative today. Since I focus on the rhetoric of images in my talk, I show quite a few rather shocking photos used by the Anti-Vaccine League. In particular, I would like to issue a warning that my talk includes images of sick and dead children. And you can see that I start with a whimsical image of a stamp commemorating Jenner's discovery of the smallpox vaccine um, to give you and myself some time um, to issue this warning. I will start by introducing the historic anti-vaccine movement, and then I will move on to um, talking about the use of images by that vaccine movement. I frame the use of these images by talking about the status of contemporaneous science, and then continue by focusing on the characteristics of the visual medium and the uncanny images in health promotion in general. And in the very end, I will briefly talk about the situation today um, and show some examples from the COVID-related um, health education. Between 1873 and 1893, around 30 pathogens were first described, including the tuberculosis bacillus, as well as the cholera and typhus bacilli. 
starting prominently with the development of the smallpox vaccine by Edward Jenner in the 1790s, immunizations were subsequently developed during the 19th century, for example, the cholera, anthrax, and rabies vaccines. And Louis Pasteur was, of course, majorly um, a, a major contributor to this development. With the introduction of vaccines, legislation was introduced to prescribe public health measures to achieve uh, the reduction in fatalities and ultimately mass immunity. So I'm showing a few dates um, with respect to the early vac vaccination legislation. The first vaccine law was the Bavarian vaccination law introduced as early as 1807. The UK introduced the British Vaccination Act in 1840, and the Reichsimpfgesetz for Imperial Germany was established in 1874. And many other countries issued similar legislation during that time. The opposition to vaccination was fueled by these vaccine legislations during the following decades. The main criticism the anti-vaccinists expressed was that the legislation presented a violation of personal integrity. A prominent example for anti-vaccine law protests is a mass protest in Leicester in March of 1885 with an estimated 100,000 protesters, followed by a local election in the following year that led to anti-vaccinators as representatives on a local administrative board, which was responsible for the enforcement of the vaccination acts. And these anti-vaccinators pledged non-compliance with the law. This was likely one of the incidents that contributed to the consensus objection in the 1898 revised English Vaccine Act. In the US, various anti-vaccine leagues were founded around that time. The Anti-Vaccination Society of America was founded in 1879, the New England Anti-Compulsory Vaccine League in 1882, and the Anti-Vaccination League of New, York, of New York City in 1885. And of course, this protest and these anti-vaccine uh, movements were not limited to Europe or the States. Um, here is a photo from Toronto. This is a little bit later in 1919, which gives us the opportunity to have a photograph of um, anti-vaccine protests in Toronto. And of course, I really like the banner stating that um, compulsory vaccination is German born. The various organized bodies of the Anti-Vaccine League issued all kinds of material, such as posters, this one, naming many physicians that um, took a stance against vaccines. Um, this is a letter to the editor from the Times in 1875, in, in which a new parent complains about receiving unsolicited postcards that took a stance against vaccines. This would be a postcard um, like the one that the parent in the letter to the editor um, complains about, not exactly the same one because this is from the Irish Vaccination League, but it must have been a similar one. So postcards were issued and then there were cartoons, for example, this um, in um, connection to the smallpox a crisis in Montreal um, that um, describes economic interest of vaccines. Here's another cartoon um, against compulsory vaccination um, showing um, a US citizen here in the middle um, in the hands of Jenner and the law that enforces um, Jenner's ideas. And there's even a hymn against compulsory vaccination um, that um, was probably sung during the protests. So how did the Anti-Vaccine League use these images? Concurrently to the advances in epidemiology and hygiene, the new medium of photography developed as one of the most culturally relevant technological inven inventions during the second half of the 19th century. The various applications of photography also included medical photography. And here you have, of course, the famously X-ray images. So this is the first X-ray image of Bertha Röntgen's hand. Um, you have microphotography, and this is not actually in a photograph, but this is the um, photoxallographic rendition of a microphotograph as it was issued in popular magazines at the time. And then up very famously, um, Etienne Jules Marais movement photographs. The result of these various applications of photography in the medical field was an augmented tool of observation of the body. This marks an important aspect of the theory of photography with, for example, Walter Benjamin, and Laszlo moholy commenting on the ability of photography to display what we cannot see with the naked eye and what Benjamin terms the optical unconscious. 
With the new technologies of rotational printing and xylographic image printing, the journals, newspapers, and magazines that disseminated information both in textual and visual form developed into modern mass media. Reading circles and a growing public library system further supported the popular press in establishing itself as a common accessible and influential source of information for the wider, wider population. At the time, the various magazines, often what was called family magazines, also of course included hygiene related information such as this image here, for example. The anti-vaccine organizations built on this system of publication when they established magazines that imitated the family journal style publications. Some examples are the Impfgegner, so the anti-vaccinist, the Impfzwanggegner, the anti-compulsory vaccinist, and what I'm showing here is the Reichsdeutsche Impfgegner, which is the new name for the um, anti-vaccinists or the anti-compulsory vaccinists rather, um, which changed in 1933 under Nazi dictatorship. So I'm showing a magazine title from a tiny little bit later than the other material I focus on. And I'm just doing this because this uh, particular image became very prominent um, among um, anti-vaccinist material. And I would also like to add English publication. This is the bulletin of the Anti-Vaccination League of America. Less, less crass um, the images, but still children are being displayed as vaccine victims. Here's a title page from 1916. With publications like these, the anti-vaccine activists used the established media strategy of the time. They produced publications that resemble family journals. As a point of comparison, for example, the title page of the magazine with the highest print run in Germany at the time, Die Gartenlaube, which translates into the gazebo, which is a very good name for a magazine, I think. The volume of publications issued by anti-vaccine organizations increased significantly in the second half of the 19th century. I can show you a statistic, and this statistic doesn't um, show actually a rise in print volume, but it shows a um, rise in the number of titles that they issue. One of these publications is anti-vaccinist Hugo Wegner's 1912, Der Impffriedhof, The Vaccine Cemetery, which displays a collection of vaccine victim narratives proclaiming on its title page that the reader will be presented with, with 36,000 cases, including 139 images. Wegner's publication is not a magazine, but it is a collection of images used in other publications including magazines and pamphlets. The publication presents the fate of international vaccine victims in a list of numbered cases. The cases are styled um, in the manner similar to medical case studies, and thus the publication imitates the medical genre and medical data reporting practices. This is one example of how anti-vaccinists use formal elements of the medical genre in order to make their messages appear as scientific evidence. Other strategies are the use of statistics and, of course, the use of images. The images used in Wigner's collection are on the surface effective due to their shock value, especially since they often display children. This is another um, title of Wigner's from 1911 called The Blessing of Vaccines. However, the impact these images have on the viewer goes beyond the shock value. The specific effect of the individual images is intensified in special image combinations. And what is characteristic to these collages is also characteristic for individual images, albeit less intense. So collection, for example, contains collages such as this one, which shows a montage of an image within an image. The juxtaposition of the images of the same child healthy and alive and the documented death is meant as an evidential record of a vaccine fatality. Beyond this implied meaning, the collage employs visual and spatial presentation to prompt the curiosity of the reader. The individual is not only displayed at one stage of their life, but two instances, instances are given. As is characteristic for the visual argument, the reader is prompted to fill in the blanks, supported by the accompanying biographical sketch, the aforementioned, the aforementioned case study, and create a biographical narrative. The active involvement of the reader not only increases the impact, it also supports the perception of having been a direct witness to this child's fate. The witness effect amplifies an emotional response that typically leads to identification, 
especially as the images show that common relatable people are affected. Such a reaction could be phrased as, this person is like me. What happened to them could happen to anyone. It could happen to me, to my child. Another example displays the same technique, but depicts an adult vaccine victim. The images thus simultaneously promote quasi evidence with reference to scientific medical modes of data presentation and a narrative mode of evidence that is based on pseudo witness feelings. I don't think this is a contradiction. Uh, this contradiction is accidental rather, but rather intrinsic to campaigns like these. The supporters most likely perceive this as covering all bases rather than as being contradictory. Importantly, both of these strategies are manifested visually. The images go even further in establishing the idea of first-hand witness evidence. The title page of this issue of Der Impfgegner from 1883 solicits the reader to send in case narratives. And you can see this here, the this is the paragraph that asks readers to send in their own stories of vaccine victims. Um, and here they're not yet asking for people to send in photographs, but in later issues this changes and they're actually um, soliciting photographs. This adds to the perception of the cases as factual and the images as evidence. Furthermore, the photographs circulated among the different organizations of the anti-vaccine proponents, and many photographs were used repeatedly. They become, to use Roland Barthes' term, coded as objective evidence. The images used by the Anti-Vaccine League are all the time regularly associated with a specific message, and this message becomes fixed for any similar image. Especially since the photos resemble medical case photography, this coding includes an erroneous scientific appearance. Obviously, however, the kind of evidence produced here is not based on the communication of results that are a product of a methodology which is vetted by a discipline, as Ludwig, Ludwig Fleck describes part of the epistemological structure of scientific evidence. The supposed evidential character rather has its origin in the medial implications of the material, in its context, and in the way the material is presented. To sum up this aspect of the anti-vaccine images, Despite the scientific developments and the invested attempts of hygienists to communicate the advances through the similarly evolving media, the Anti-Vaccine League was successful in promoting their material as evidence to large parts of the population. They employed strategies that modeled medical image presentation, mimicked popular media outlets, and thus created an iconography and subsequently implemented a code for their images. Anti-vaccine activists crafted a narrative and subsequently an iconography that is fueled by the status of medical science and its popularization at the time. Notably, the process of immunization is complex and remains what can be described as a black box. It is part of a system but remains itself largely opaque. This inexplicability is an issue in the context of historic medicine, but I would even argue that that remains to some extent true today. People fear the unknown, and even more so the invisible unknown, which makes immunization a major anxiety trigger, since an invisible unknown enters one's body. The complex process of immunization is furthermore not intuitively understood. There is no handy metaphor to simplify popular information campaigns. This situation is typical for a scenario in which people adapt to alternatives which capitalize on perceived or actual uncertainty. The black box situation, the reality that cannot be seen with the naked eye, makes room for imagination. It invites hypotiposis, namely the fictional supplement of vivid imagery. In case of vaccines, this imagery is what historians of medicine Martina King and Thomas Rutten have termed mythoscientific, which means the images invite the construction of theories to fill the void that look scientific, but are not. One could only say, also say this with very simple words. People don't know what is going on and then they make something up. Anti-vaccine activists utilize the virulent doubts when promoting their argument that vaccines are harmful, even poisonous for the body. Instead of receiving vaccines, the movement recommends strengthening the body naturally, underlining the argument with the intuitive allegory of the body as a fortress against the outside enemy. The simplicity of the explanation insinuates a false sense of expertise in the audience, which might even be perceived as empowerment and as informed decision-making with regard to one's own health. 
Such feeling of expertise is more attractive than the confusion and fear that are evoked by the complexity of the immunization process. The images used by the anti-vaccine proponents with their easily understood narrative, the quasi witness status, the aspect of identification and empathy are readily at hand to enforce this turn to alternative medicine. Until rhetoric and semiotics of vaccination become the leading paradigm, until immunization becomes, as Roberto Esposito writes, the general paradigm of modernity, the concepts challenge visualization into protocols and invite for a vacuum to be filled. So up to here, the talk investigated the content and the context of the images. I will now move on to include the form of the medium involved, the characteristics of photography as a visual medium, and I will talk about how it supports, it supports the strategy of the anti-vaccinists. Photography, when it was established as a new visual medium, was perceived as uncanny. And in line with the associations of the public with the emerging medium, photography, and later on film, oftentimes displayed uncanny and even horrific content. Phenomena like spirit photography and similar genre made use of the technological potential of photography to display a supposed reality. Considering that photography reveals what is otherwise invisible, and I'm repeating my slide from the beginning to remind you of that, um, as Benjamin phrased it in its notion of the optical unconscious, it is not surprising that actual ghosts creep in. And this is a typical um, example for spirit photography um, at the end of the 19th century. Spirit photography is thus a prime example of how photography reveals the uncanny potential of its own technology. Ultimately, spirit photographs uncover how the medium of photography includes an element of fear. The anti-vaccine material makes use of this inherent uncanny potential of photography. In a twisted logic characteristic for the use of the new medium at the time, so this is not particularly um, for the um, anti-vaccine people, it's the general characteristic at the time, the photographs used by anti-vaccinators claim to make visible, to reveal the invisible horrors of vaccination. This effect is amplified by the recognized void. The void created by the lack of an easily understandable explanation is filled with a narrative horror which photography already insinuates due to how it is perceived as a medium. A similar uncanny effect can be attributed to print media at the time to which I would like to at least point, but I cannot elaborate on it in this talk. In promoting vaccines, not only the invisibility of the physical process provided an obstacle for health campaigns and an opportunity for anti-vaccine proponents, for Jenner, evaluating the success of immunization was solely based on observation. After the introduction of microbiology by Pasteur and Koch, scientists had an understanding of the immunological processes of vaccines. However, their experiments were still largely guided by observing effective immunity. Furthermore, the microbiological aspects that were known were complex and thus not ready at hand for hygiene education of the larger public. And I would argue that the situation with respect to communicating epidemiological information is not significantly different today. And in addition to the immunological processes, they could, so in addition, the immunological processes could and still can not be displayed to the larger public directly. So public health communication uses graphics, such as this one, for example, that we have all seen a lot, which explains the difference between the mRNA vaccines and the vaccines without the viral vector. As there are, and historically were, no accessible images of the actual physical immunization process, the success of vaccines was communicated, for example, through visual evidence of the observable features during the late 18th and 19th century. An early example is the use of the well-known image of the milkmaid's arm, published by Edward Jenner in 1798. The immune reaction provided visual evidence of an observable fact. The representation set the stage for development that relies largely on conveying what can be observed with the naked eye, despite this aspect being a secondary feature of vaccines. So this arm image is very well known. It has been used over and over again, including also in medical discourse, and not only in images, but um, this is a, a wax moulage from um, Queen's own Museum of Healthcare that also explains displays this. 
Relying on what is visible on the outside both supports and disrupts the public promotion of vaccines. While such images provide an easily understandable argument and thus support health education, the images do not show the actual vaccine process, but its secondary effect. Rather than developing a visual archive of the invisible function of vaccines, which might indeed have been an option given the understanding of its broad mechanism at the time, medical popularization went with the intuitively more accessible idea of presenting visuals of patients or visual renditions of the practice of vaccines. And these became genre images at the time. Using the circumstances of vaccines to stand for the physical process itself becomes part of the information that promotes and opposes vaccines and establishes a metonymical use of visual information. Metonymical in the sense that it uses a part of a whole to represent the entirety of the process. This metonymical use might very well become coded. However, it uses an isolated secondary aspect as aspect to denote the process and thus the void of an accessible scientific explanation remains. Presenting visual observations of individual cases rather than a general theory provided vaccine skeptics with a manual for using visual rhetoric for their purpose and against hygiene education. In other words, the coding that the Anti-Vaccine League successfully established for their photographs had its precedent in use of visuals in academically supported health promotion. Jenner's image of the milkmaid's hand, for example, was referenced by compositionally similar images used as part of the anti-vaccine propaganda. And this is another image, this time a drawing from Wegener's um, vaccine cemetery. The 1912 anti-vaccine publication turns the information conveyed by the original image into its opposite, utilizing the recognition factor that constitutes the genre image. Once available, photographs continue this trajectory. Frequently using photographs such as this, displaying an arm with an infection or eczema that displays a supposed vaccine accident, the anti-vaccine movement employed the established system of coded images in health education to its advantage. In repeatedly performing this metonymical gesture, so the blemished arm as a code for vaccine accidents, the images ultimately instituted a mental connection that, when the propaganda was successful, was perceived as scientific evidence. An effect of this recognition value is that over time, anti-vaccine images are established as a genre and as an iconography of sorts. Summing up the argument, the historic anti-vaccine movement made use of the fear associated with the practice of vaccines. This fear led to horrific images and visuals that fill the void of a scientific explanation. In addition, the rhetoric employed images to instigate an individual narrative as a way to persuade their readers through empathy and by means of an accessible argument that started with observable symptoms as a part of an individual fate. The evidential potential of the strategy is grounded in the utilization of the corresponding uncanny characteristic of photography and in the similarities to established epistemological frameworks in medicine and hygiene education. These factors allowed for the visual anti-vaccine material to establish a code that made the images appear evidential. And I said in the beginning that I would go use, go and um, look at some uh, examples from the COVID health education. So if we look at some examples from the reaction to the COVID-19 vaccines, we can identify some of the main features of the historic anti-vaccine rhetoric or from um, uh, developments that prompt this kind of rhetoric. So here's an interview with a researcher published in The Guardian um, recently. Um, a researcher who worked on the Moderna vaccine, and um, he or she explains how they found out that the second dose pushes the immunity by accident. And I um, have I put the quote I would like to focus on in bold here at the bottom. Scientists said they still could not fully explain why the half dose gave better protection, but said it may be that it triggers the immune system differently. Although accidental discoveries and unpredictability are, as hans jörg Heinberger has stated, Embedded in the structure of science, or more specifically, the experimental system, the communication of such perceived uncertainty sparks doubts in the larger population. And this doubt is utilized by anti-vaccine organizations in a manner similar to the strategies of the 19th centuries. Furthermore, anti-vaccine rhetoric still relies on personal narratives. And here is an um, article from the Globe and Mail from this past January. And I would like to just point out, I, I 
pulled out four quotes, but I would like to just quote the first two. So this is an organization called Vaccine Choice Canada. They coordinated local parents to share anecdotes of alleged vaccine harm. And the second one, the New Brunswick mom of three shared her own emotional story of perceived harm caused to her children following vaccination. I would like to strongly point out here that I'm not dismissing this or criticizing this. I'm just trying to um, see threads about differences in communication between the different factors involved here. The personal accounts given in the 2021 context resemble the use of the same kind of narratives in the historic anti-vaccine movement. Since no children have been vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccine yet, there is no image material produced at this point about young vaccine victims. However, material such as this flyer um, issued by the German anti-vaccine group Physicians for Enlightenment in 2020 has the characteristic features shown for 19th century material. It uses a photograph of a suffering child. It looks scientific. The inside shows statistical figures and names professors as authors. It has the optics of a flyer that's laid out in a doctor's office waiting room. And it seems issued by some official source if you look at the bottom here at this official looking medical logo. The extended look at the historic material can thus show us some characteristics that can still be identified today. I'm looking forward to discussing this with you, but before um, I return back to Jessica, um, I would like to um, say that I'm very grateful that Jessica can pre Jessica presents this talk uh, today. Um, she works on the Contagious Disease Act, and so it's always good to instigate some communication uh, between researchers at Queen's, so if anyone would like to talk to her about that, um, and Victorian visual culture in general. And I'm particularly grateful because she is right at the moment writing her qualifying exam. So it's very special that she took the time to moderate this talk. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Christina. That was a great talk. Uh, very fascinating. And I love these. This example from 2020 is just, I can't believe that it, it, so, it resembles so much those, uh, those 19th century sources, um, which is just crazy. Um, so I'd like to remind everyone that if you have any questions, uh, you can use the Q&A feature. Um, only Christiane and I can uh, see your questions, so we will read them out to you here. Um, but just maybe to begin the discussion, I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about sort of the, the technology of photography itself and how these people understood it at that time. Um, specifically, were they able to distinguish between different uses of photography and potentially what could be seen as scientific or what may include fraud? Because we were able to manipulate photographs at this time in history, right? Yes, and I think that um, all the different features with which you could, could manipulate photographs um, were, um, they jumped on that, right? So it was a new technology, so they did everything they could with this. And you can even see it in the image of um, the x-ray image, um, because the hand with the ring is kind of even a playful idea to use this kind of x-ray images, and then all the stuff that was done with x-rays. Um, but the, what I find a particularly fascinating example is the spirit photography. And for that, um, I have seen examples in um, these family magazines where um, people try to enlighten the public that that is flawed. Right? So you can see that people are trying to educate people that look, um, they are photographs and they are photographs that represent reality and they are photographs that don't. But that is so frauded from the beginning, right? So how can you ever tell those apart? And when you then um, kind of see the whole context of these family magazines, the kind of metaphors they use and the stories they tell and how they put um, serial novels or novella, novellas next to scientific, re scientific reports, next to popular scientific reports and whatever, then this is so mixed that it must have been so incredibly difficult for the people to distinguish at the time um, that you can kind of see how they also kind of wanted to believe in all of these things that you can all, that you can all of a sudden see because it was kind of made everything more interesting, right? And then the um, photo, so there is a photographer, Mumler, who was then um, persecuted for fraud um, at some point. So people had obviously knew that that was not real and that was fraud, right? But at the same time, 
we want to believe lots of things too that we know that aren't realized that they were different in that respect. Yeah, very, very interesting. Um, we had a first question come in, was asking about the seal in the bottom corner. Um, I think they're referring to an image that you showed. Yeah. Um, if you want to elaborate on that. Yeah. So I can share the screen again and show that um, last picture again. Um, so I believe that this is what um, the, the, the question is about. Well, it's the Ask Club, um, I don't know, um, in German, it's called Askelop stick. You would um, um, uh, translate this um, with the snake around. So yeah, it makes this look official in some way. But you can, I mean, as an organization, you can adapt whatever seal or logo you like. Um, and as long as nobody else is using it, you're free to um, employ it to underline your argument. And it certainly makes this look um, scientific, right? Um, here it says um, physicians for enlightenment, and then it shows that that kind of seal, so, yeah. Right, very interesting. Um, we have another person who has asked, um, back to the future snapshots of vaccines, what would uh, the global population look like if we do not vaccinate uh, communicable diseases? Um, this is an interesting question because we're getting at uh, some of those issues that you know, originated in history and have continued to, uh, to sort of be asked in, in our present day as well. Yeah, I mean, um, if the person who asked the question is at, um, at Queens, an easy thing, as soon as the Museum of Healthcare opens again, um, we can all go and have a look again at the iron lungs. And we know one thing, for example, one very horrible thing um, that we would still have around or that we would still deal with if we didn't have vaccines. Um, Many of us are of an age that we wouldn't have even reached uh, if vaccines weren't around. So yeah, there's, yeah, it's hard to speculate um, um, at this point. I'm not an epidemiologist at all, far from it. But um, I mean, it's obvious that we have some clear advantages here with vaccines. The question is just, I'm looking at the question, how do we communicate those um, in order to actually reach people? And um, looking at historic examples, it seems like we haven't progressed very much in that respect. So we have progressed with the science, um, but it seems we haven't really progressed with how do we communicate this effectively in some way. No. Yeah, that's a really, really interesting point. I remember um, in some of my own reading on uh, the anti-vaccine movement in the 19th century context, um, there was a lot of questions around efficacy of the vaccines. And it was very, very difficult at the time to visibly show the results uh, to people. Um, and what they could visibly see was, was the scarring of the actual vaccine. And that itself looks quite frightening as we've seen from some of the examples shown here, which we know can be to some degree manipulated or um, fraudulent in that sense. But there, there is a scar left through the process of the smallpox vaccination. Um, and it did cause a lot of irritants to small children. Um, so they could physically see those effects, but they couldn't necessarily see the effect of diminishing numbers of disease, right? And you're absolutely correct. That's still something that we seem to, to struggle with showing people today in, in a way that sort of visually conveys that information. Yeah, mm -hmm. if there's no immediate question, I can relate to that a little bit more. Um, when I started working on this topic, I thought um, I would easily see through uh, the rhetoric of um, the Anti-Vaccine League and be able to dissect it and then show all these people are doing this and this and this. And what actually happened looking at this over several, I've looked at this now over several years is that I, kind of see the point a little bit more because um, especially when they um, issued these first vaccine laws, they had very little understanding or they had um, a basic understanding of what was going on, but it was more observation than an actual look into the um, scientific process at the time. And what they could certainly not do is communicate that. So in a way, they ask people to do something that they couldn't explain to them and that to some extent they could only observe but not really properly explain either. So I thought, yeah, that, that is, that's not so easy in a way, right? You have to really 
find a way to explain things properly. And otherwise you really open the door for people to come in and um, yeah, undermine you. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Um, so we have another question that just came in. Um, really enjoyed the talk, thank you. Um, is the main difference between the two slides um, that one relies on science and the other on perception and manipulation of information? Um, so I think maybe they are referring to the last two slides of the discussion, perhaps. I'm not totally sure. So what I was trying to show is that despite, I am completely clear that there is nowadays a distinction between what is accepted in the scientific community and what has been vetted as scientifically sound and what the anti-vaccine people pretend to be scientific. Sound. But at the same time, the way that both communicate their stuff really overlaps. Mm -hmm. um, and the more I looked at the 19th century material, the more it occurred to me that it overlapped from the very beginning. So that is what I'm trying to point out. So in a way, no is the answer to that question in a way. No, because they're both using similar strategies and I think that both kind of strategies that they're using with the images and how they're displaying them um, op are open for manipulation. So the way that it is communicated, um, even, even within, so even the um, academically um, sound um, popularization of medicine um, or of epidemiological facts and of vaccines gives this kind of wiggle room to be used against it, definitely in the 19th century. I cannot vouch for that today enough. I haven't looked at enough examples because I'm a 19th century person, so that is what I focus on. But in the 19th century, the kind of use of images by the Anti-Vaccine League is completely based on the use of images in medicine. And if you can do that, then you have to ask what makes it so manipulative, easily manipulative. Mm -hmm. Really, yeah, very much. Um, another question here, um, any observations to share regarding the increasing use of visual social media platforms and consequences for informed public debate on anything? And this is a really interesting one. And it's a question that I had is it relates to a question that I had as well regarding um, the way that community is formed through um, in the 19th century context and in our current uh, context through sharing of social media. But in the 19th century, they you know, these publications specifically asked people to submit their own evidence in a really interesting way that I think really mirrors what we see in terms of sharing on social media, if you could maybe speak to, to that. Yeah, so um, it is not significantly different. Uh, let's put it like that. So um, when uh, people were asked to send in their um, vaccine victim narratives to um, anti-vaccine publications, that is similar to when people now publish their um, personal stories on Twitter or on Instagram. Um, so it's kind of the same movement. And you kind of also stir up the same reaction by the people who see this. Um, you think someone sends in something they witness, and therefore this is automatically true. Right? Um, and it might be that the people who sent this in totally believe that that is true, what they're sending in. It might even not be the case, but you do perceive this as true, right? So because you get this quasi witness statement and that was the case at the time. And when you look at these unsolicited postcards that were being sent out by the anti-vaccine elite, um, that is also a similar thing. So you're being now approached by um, information that you don't want, right? Because it unsolicited comes in your, in your media feeds or into your house or it reaches you because friends share it or however. So there's a very, there's a strong similarity. So it's not like in the 19th century they did this and that's completely different from what we do today. I think it's quite similar, just different kinds of media were involved, but the sentiment is quite, quite similar. Cool. Really interesting. Um, another question here, do you know the proportion of the population that supported the anti-vaccine movement? So do we have maybe statistics that reflect this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I knew that question was going to come, and no, I don't, and I tried to find out, um, and um, whenever you read um, historians who were trying to find out by the statistics, they say that it's really hard to say from today, um, so it, 
it's you can't because there weren't any um, um, statistics being done where people were asked to fill in a form and say, um, are you pro or against vaccines? So our really only chance is by looking at um, how many publications these people were producing um, and the fact that they were rising um, seems to suggest that this had some success um, and it has some success today. So why wouldn't it then? It's kind of logical in a way. And then if you also look at these large anti-vaccine protests, um, I know that that is a difficult way to judge things because today it might be similar, right? We might think that there's a sizable part of the population that um, resists vaccines, but if you actually ask people, it might just be that the people who are against us are very loud and therefore see more um, and aren't all that many in the end. But um, yeah, I mean, there were 100,000 people at that protest in Leicester and there seems to be sources for that. And they had quite a significant influence. So if you read um, proceedings uh, in like government um, protocols at the time, uh, minutes, um, they were talking about this. So it was something that politicians picked up on and seemed important enough. So there were enough voices talking about this. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we could talk about um, the audience for these publications a little bit more, sort of how, like, were they reaching the average Joe or uh, were they sort of more targeted than that? Um, I think that from how I judge the people who send in their stuff, because that is the best way to judge this. So who sent in photos in the end and who sent in um, um, vac vaccine reports. Um, it was mostly the what you just said, the average Joe. Um, surprisingly often it was also physicians who sent in um, uh, uh, problems with vaccines they had had. And um, I mean, we have to also acknowledge that there were ex vaccine accidents at the time. And there are famous cases um, where um, several people um, had vaccine accidents. I mean, um, I was a um, I was in Lübeck for a while, and the Calmet um, incident there is very famous. And there's an incident in Montreal around this a little bit earlier than that, actually, which also became a, a huge reference point. So. When I talked about the fear of vaccines before, I don't want to say that don't want to say that that was just made up, right? Or just because photography was uncanny. There were real concerns at the time too, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question here. Um, have you looked at photos used by the pro-vaccine people at the turn of the century, showing uh, victims of natural smallpox, not necessarily from vaccines? Yes. That. Hmm. That was done much less so. So um, I have looked at um, accounts, um, especially one account of a person who did actually give um, hygiene talks and I've been to the um, Hygiene Museum in Dresden and I've been to the archives in Dresden and looked through um, the material that people used um, who try to um, support vaccine campaigns. Um, and much like today, there is a different approach. So there seems to be an understanding um, which makes complete sense that um, people who support vaccine campaigns and public hygienists don't retreat to individual narratives. Um, when I started working on this, I tried to really pay close attention to when this comes up today. If people were really putting up um, parents so stories about parents who didn't have their child vaccinated against measles and that child then dies or something like that and when I started working on this I never found anything mm -hmm. uh, so it was a clear um, um, commitment to um, uh, unsentimental um, straightforward purely factual scientific communication in the last few years that has changed and it has changed both in the Canadian context and in the German context. So in the last, I would say four or five-ish even years, we occasionally do get those stories. Um, and I am completely undecided about that, I have to say. Um, one day I think that's good because we need to counter what's out there with the same um, kind of uh, strength. And this is a strong rhetoric to use. And some days I think, oh, no, 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 we cannot do that because we kind of lower our 
that that lowers um, the vaccine campaigns to that same um, to that kind of same level, and we should never do that. So it really, I really, I'm completely undecided about that. I have no solution. <laughs> Really interesting. Uh, this question in an interesting way kind of relates to that. And we, I mean, we're talking about a rhetoric of fear, um, but this person is asking about satire, um, which is another sort of language that we can uh, look at these things through. Um, so she says, uh, or they say, sorry, in the uh, modern day, um, issues like vaccination and anti-vaccination attitudes are approached with a good degree of satire, particularly within the youth on um, and on social media. Do you feel that there were uh, paralleled approaches to the topic in the 19th century. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I can share this again, one of the um, images. So this is, I'm showing anti-vaccine material, right? But one of the images I did show, I'm not gonna go back here. Um, where are my cartoons? This one here, right? This is quite satirical. So I'm making it, so I mean, there's a little bit of, uh, Satire was a little bit differently framed in the 19th century than it is today. It was kind of more, um, um, kind of more broadly hewn, if you want. Um, but this is a very satirical idea, right? To kind of portray these guys here in this very comical fashion, and this poor guy here in the middle as being um, tied up. Um, and then also, I mean, this, <laughs> it is, I mean, um, in addition to the fact that it is completely in line with um, arguments today, so there's money in it. Also how to, to phrase this vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate with one, two and three exclamation marks is kind of exaggerating something and then kind of using that, turning it into its opposite, right? This is against um, vaccination, there's money in it, so it's satirical. Yeah, it's a little different than um, what you see today, but I mean, it's satirical still, let's say. Mm -hmm. I've also, uh, I should add, I've, se I've seen examples um, of uh, cartoons depicting people turning into cows post-vaccine oh, yeah. and uh, that kind of thing, which um, sort of uses that element of humor or satire, um, still sort of maybe to some degree playing on that, that fear narrative. Um, but uh, yeah, really interesting, interesting yeah. stuff. Yeah, there's that that image is famous um, where um, kind of little cow heads grow out of people that have been vaccinated. Um, yeah, um, I have a feeling though. I um, I know that I I have shown this image before, but I have the feeling that that is more a kind of public sentiment rather than um, politically uh, minded anti-vaccine people expressing their view. So there seems to be so maybe satire is more found in that realm of kind of people in general picking up on some topic that is being discussed and showing all kinds of sides satirically, um, rather than really making sure that their um, opinion is heard by using this kind of strong rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, if anybody else has any uh, last questions and they wanna get them in, we have a few minutes left here. Um, we do have a couple comments and questions um, regarding the actual uh, COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. Um, as we've kind of already said, we're not necessarily immunologists, uh, so we can't uh, necessarily speak to um, how they work in our contemporary context. Um, I actually showed that image to um, underline that when we see this, we don't necessarily gain much more information. I don't. I see them and I think, funny little image. Right. <laughs> what that right. is, it's the mRNA, mRNA vector vaccine thingy. Next. <laughs> so yeah, it's not very, I mean, that, that's the, I, I understand that that's the best you can do. I mean, how, but I'm trying to show that that is still complex, right? We haven't evolved all that much. Not, we're all, not all of a sudden a public um, that is so much more educated. We are much more educated, but we still don't get these intricacies of vaccines, especially if they also get more complicated, like it is the case today. And um, so people still, I mean, obviously it's a normal thing to do, reject what they don't understand. Mm -hmm. I, I can, I totally understand that. <laughs> right, right. And that's a, I mean, it's, it's interesting because it, it's, um, we understand the technology that was used, you know, we understand 
variolation and that kind of thing. Now it's still extremely frightening in that, that idea that we are essentially giving ourselves the virus in order to protect ourselves from the virus. Um, but the, the, yeah, the MRNA, um, technology is, is new and is still, um, is, is poses a whole new set of challenges to, uh, educators, um, in the scientific community and otherwise to try to, uh, to encourage people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, we are coming to the end. Um, we have sort of talked about um, photography in particular, um, uh, but maybe if we could return to the idea of um, scientific evidence again, just to um, sort of maybe um, if there's anything else you wanted to, to add to that discussion um, regarding how they, they understood and interpreted science. Um, at the time mm -hmm. or in comparison to today? I mean, it could, yeah, it could be both. I mean, I think again, these questions that we're getting about the sort of the science behind the vaccine, I think maybe are saying something about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, what it comes down to is that we all, and that is the lay public, and um, I am um, quite sure, and I haven't, I have read some of it, but not too much on um, how scientists actually regard um, scientific images in scientific articles. But everything points to the fact that it is quite a similar process. We all want to create a narrative that makes sense. Um, and narratives aren't necessarily fictional, but a narrative is always a structure that relies on filling the blanks, right? So you have some pictures and you don't necessarily have, for example, a causality between them. And when you make, when you turn it into a narrative that makes sense, um, you supply that causality to it. Um, and you supply that causality to it, which is that moment where all kinds of issues can come in. Right? So you can, you can do it in such a way that it then um, is in line with the scientific findings, but it can also happen that it's not. Right? So there might not, I'm, I, when I answered before, I tried to kind of put it in a way as if there was a solution, as if there was the perfect way to communicate this out there and that we just have to find it. Maybe that's even, Maybe that's not even possible, right? Mm -hmm. Because you cannot communicate perfectly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, one final thought that just came in, um, the idea of narrative uh, sounds like an impact statement and thus almost a way of putting the vaccine on public trial. Um, do you feel like this is an accurate assessment? Aren't, isn't that definitely always the case? As long as you don't make vaccines um, compulsory, it's on public trial. You are relying on people believing you. Um, and you have to tell them a story that, that convinces them right, that it's what it comes down to. And let's hope that people come up with convincing stories so that we get lots and lots of people vaccinated um, and that everybody, that so many people are willing to get vaccinated that we then receive and achieve herd immunity. And, can leave our rooms again without masks at some point. <laughs> that's right, that's right. I hope you need. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I just will conclude now. Um, it's almost five. I will say thank you so much, Christiane. This was an incredibly informative and fascinating talk. Um, I hope everyone else got as much out of it as I did. Thank you all for attending. Um, I will let you know that next week's uh, talk is by Scott McKenzie from the Department of Film and Media, um, and it's titled Contagious Humor, and it looks at the role of humor in responding to the pandemic. So a, a little bit of levity from the last couple of weeks, which have been quite serious uh, discussions uh, happening next week. So hopefully you can tune in for that. Uh, thank you all so much. And if you have any questions uh, that didn't get answered or um, want to discuss this further, uh, Christiane and I are both available uh, via email. So yeah. Thank you again. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening.